to the Friday Night Forum series, and this evening our discussion topic is Revolutionary Feminism, Interests in Socialist Feminism, Ideas and Activism in the UK. Uh, my name is Max Regal, I'll be your chairperson tonight. I am a former president of New York Radical Women and a member of Seattle FSP, an activist here. And I want to welcome everyone on behalf of both Radical Women and the Freedom Socialist Party to our hall tonight. A little bit about us. Radical Women is a grassroots activist women's organization and we provide a radical voice within the feminist movement and a feminist voice within the left. And we train women to be leaders in all of the movements for social and economic justice. FSP, Freedom Socialist Party, is a revolutionary socialist feminist organization dedicated to the replacement of capitalism with a genuine workers' democracy that will guarantee full economic, social, political, and legal, e legal equality for all. Um, we promote the leadership of women, people of color, queers, and the most oppressed as the best leaders in that struggle for liberation. Radical Women and the Freedom Socialist Party are sister organizations in that we share the same dedication to socialist feminism and we both seek to replace this rotten system with one that is guided by those who do the work. Yes! So welcome. Agenda um, will include a presentation by Sam, Dr. Sam Solomon, and that will be followed by discussion, questions, interaction from you all, and then we'll break and adjourn for the formal part of the evening, and the bar will be open, there will be snacks available, and we can continue uh, discussing the powerful ideas in a more informal setting. Before we start, I wanted to point out a couple of logistics this evening. We have a bookstore in the back where you can pick up all kinds of ideas and uh, theory to guide you and to stimulate your education going forward. We also have uh, food available, as I said, and there's a raffle this evening that will help cover the costs of the, uh, putting the program on. And I wanted to also invite you to some upcoming venues where we can continue the discussion topic tonight as well as other discussions. There are two flyers or three flyers on your uh, tables. This is what they look like. There's one from Radical Women announcing the discussion circle uh, that starts on Tuesday, July 28th. That's just upcoming at Freeway Hall here. And we talk about more about Radical Women as well as some other meetings and events Radical Women is having. And the Green Flyer announces a Freedom Socialist Party meeting back here at Freeway Hall on Thursday, July 23rd. That's this coming Thursday. And that will feature a discussion on the current um, events in Greece and what's going on there, as well as a tribute to Leon Trotsky on the anniversary of the 75th year since his assassination. He was one of the leaders of the Russian Revolution. Additionally, I want to invite you to a very special pop-up or event, a uh, picnic celebration this Sunday, um, celebrating Anne Rogers, who's, she's leaving town to go and uh, live with her family in Utah. Anne has been a very long time member of Radical Women and the Freedom Socialist Party. She's a Chippewa elder and she has a really bold history of work, a working single mother, a unionist, and an absolutely unflinching Nazi fighter, and an advocate for Native rights. So come and join the celebration to give Anne a good send off, as well as it's, it's a nice venue where we can have food to eat and drinks. Uh, to carry on the conversation from, from this evening. There's a sunny location as well as air conditioning in the house. And it's supposed to be 90 degrees. So, um, it's hosted by Hiawatha House, and that is Christina, uh, Kathleen, and Robbie. So you can see any of them for more information. The um, event starts at 4 o'clock, and it's on Rainier Avenue, just north of us, so they can give you more specifics. 
And I wanted to ask Annalisa to say a few words about a new book that has just been published. I would love to introduce y'all, if you don't already have it, um, a book that has writers from Radical Women and the Freedom Socialist Party and supporters called Talking Back, Voices of Color. It is a book written by activists on many different issues, including education, struggles in the workplace, fights for um, environmental rights, and it also offers different suggestions, working how to strategize in the movements to create change, and some of the writers are here in this room as well as um, nationally. So I hope you check it out. It is only $15. It is right here um, in the back. And um, it's a very, it's a piece that you won't find anywhere else. Thank you. Thanks, Annalisa. So on to the main attraction. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sam Solomon, a queer Marxist activist visiting from England. Sam was born in New York. He is a member of the LA branch of the Freedom Socialist Party. He received his PhD in comparative literature at the University of Southern California, where his research topic is broadly 20th century literature, and especially poetry, as it relates to radical social movements. Sam is currently a lecturer on English and creative writing at the University of Sussex in England. Uh, the University of Sussex is one of the universities that were founded out of the radicalism of the 1960s, as opposed to Oxford and some of the old school guys. Um, he's also a co-director with Dr. Rachel O'Connell of the study for the Center for Study of Sexual Dissidents, or it's, as they say, affectionately called SexDis, <laughs> a campus group that brings together researchers and activists in queer and sexuality studies. Sam's current book project that he's working on looks at poetry and social reproduction from a Marxist feminist point of view. So Sam will be speaking tonight on the rising interest of socialist feminist, feminism ideas and activism in the UK. Welcome, Sam. Thank you so much, Max. Um, can people hear me? Yeah. All right. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, and thank you all for coming here and possibly virtually watching by live stream, I don't know. Um, split audience. Um, I am really thrilled and honored to be here and to be talking to all of you um, here. And thank you for that introduction, Max. Um, I thought it would be helpful to start off by saying a little bit about the experiences and circumstances that got me here, um, and then I'll give a quick sense of what I'll talk about before I launch into it. Um, so as Max told you, I'm a member of the Freedom Socialist Party, formerly based in Los Angeles, and still a member of the LA branch, even though I live in England, um, in Brighton, in the southeast of England. And I moved to the UK after receiving the PhD, um, and I had been doing research on British poets who were engaged in the 70s primarily in socialist feminist organizing, um, partly because that was a way for me to engage with a lot of the political questions that were most important and interesting to me while still getting to write about the literature that interested me as, for my job. So basically it seemed like the best way to, to do my job, more or less. Um, and as a student of literature, I had become interested in how poetry and art more generally had sometimes, um, and particularly in the 19th and 20th century, um, been put to the surface, the service of the state um, in a number of ways. So um, a lot of conservative thinkers had imagined that art could have sort of conservative functions um, and help people to not 
um, make revolutions if they were sort of calmed down um, by art. Um, while at the same time, I knew that poetry can be and has been a vital companion um, and source of energy and knowledge in the building of some revolutionary movements. Um, so through my life as a queer person and through my research and also through um, the somewhat precarious, although not entirely, position of being a graduate student um, and struggling to imagine, you know, what would be a nice future for people to think and talk and create together that is a little more secure and better and all of those things. Um, through all of that, I came to a pretty concrete sense of the ways that capitalism makes us less able to do all of those things um, well, and that it does that not only by taking the value that we produce and extracting it, um, but also by encouraging and exacerbating various forms of hatred among working people and also um, immiserating a lot of people around the world. Um, and one of the chief ways it does that in a lot of overdeveloped countries is by presenting a contradictory picture of racialized and feminized and disabled people, saying that they're cheaper to employ on the one hand, but also somehow a drain on productivity. So this strange contradiction. Um, and it became clear to me at that point that I had to join up to fight against that system and join up with movements that attack the system, both at the points where capital is being ac accumulated, so both in sort of workplace struggles, um, but also at the many more dispersed points where lots of divisions and prejudices are produced and reproduced, exacerbated, made murderous um, by an always capitalist, pretty much always racist, and generally heteropatriarchal state and mass media. Um, and often those workplace struggles and those other struggles against those kinds of divisions and oppressions are actually the same or simultaneous struggles. Um, so anyway, I found that a home for my work was in the Freedom Socialist Party and as a supporter of radical women. Um, so after receiving my PhD, I worked as an adjunct instructor for a year at Occidental College in LA in the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice. Um, and when I was offered a full-time job in England, um, not out of nowhere, but you know, following from many, many applications, <laughs> which is how it works, um, I decided to take it rather than to continue in the insecure employment situation that I was in, um, in a job without health, in health insurance on a sort of term-by-term -term contract that could be renewed or not. Um, so that's how it came to be that two years later I'm here, visiting here, reporting back on some of my observations, which are based on a combination of my academic work, some activism and organizing I've engaged with firsthand, and also just conversations and living in the place for a little while. Um, so in other words, I'm not here really as an academic expert on all of the things I'm going to talk about. I'm also just reporting on what I've seen um, and heard and lived, lived around. So I'm here to um, start and contribute to some discussions that I hope will um, strengthen international organizing strategies for socialist feminism and socialist feminist politics. Um, and I'm also here with a good deal of humility before the limitless wealth of organizing experience and theoretical acumen that I know are in this room tonight. Um, so my goal is to present some information about the contemporary situa situation in the UK, and some of it might be old news to some of you, um, so bear with me if that's the case. Um, and the way that I'm framing it is, of course, shaped by my politics, um, and desire to make it useful to this audience. Um, and I won't be able to talk about nearly everything that one could, um, but maybe um, some of those gaps can be discussed during our discussions formally or informally. Um, and ultimately what I want to talk about are the current, is the current situation in the UK and what it presents for an international socialist feminist politics. Um, the situation there is bad, as in many places, with the widening wealth not so much gap, but more kind of like chasms um, between rich and poor, a terrifying rise in the popularity of fascism and racism, 
and the continual and ongoing selling off of hard-earned social programs to the highest or sometimes just most well-connected bidders. Um, in other words, the young working class people who I teach in the UK, not all of them are working class, but the young people in the UK are now pretty famously aware that they have no future under the current arrangement of things. Um, the current system is unsustainable and the ruling class doesn't really seem to care. Um, so I'll talk about that big picture of the UK political economy over the last couple of decades, pretty broad strokes. I'll describe some of the resistance and organizing um, that have taken place in that same recent period. I'll introduce some theories that I think might be useful regarding the topic of social reproduction as it's been circulating among feminist activists and scholars in the UK. And then I'll give um, two, two examples, one of some housing rights and some immigrant rights organizing that have been going on there, um, spearheaded and carried out by women of color and working class women and queers in the UK. Um, and then we can have some discussion. Okay, so the general political and economic situation in the UK now over the last period, again, this is the stuff that you might be kind of old news, but you had the Thatcher era in the 80s, subsequent years, basically most of the 80s and early 90s saw response to the decline in British industry, um, the outsourcing of manufacturing work, um, closure of mines and other um, key extraction industries, mines really, in the northern and western parts of the UK, um, notably in Wales and the north of the country. Um, those years and those that followed also saw the conservative government cut the welfare state pretty significantly um, through basically the slow privatization of housing, education, and the national health services to some extent. Um, the health services less than housing and education. Um, and also the privatization of some of the key services like the um, railroad system in the UK. Um, then from like 97 to 2010, you have the years in which new labor, the new labor government is in power. Um, it's a return to the labor, labor party, but basically they're not a labor party at this point for the most part. Um, they basically decide that this move toward privatization is, is all right, um, that we need to have what they call a growth of the third sector, which is a term for sort of public-private partnerships instead of social services. Um, there's a really great parody or satire show called The Thick of It. I don't know if people have seen it, where they make fun of this and invent a fourth sector um, <laughs> that consists of like everyday superheroes or something like that. Um, um, so that all takes place and then in 2010 you have the election of a coalition government that is basically the conservative party gets most of the votes. Um, they don't get quite enough so they get this sort of upstart, wishy-washy, liberal democrat party to join up with them and take over the government and it's under that government that um, a sort of austerity agenda comes back um, fully. Of course the way had been paved by the years preceding it. Um, you have huge hikes in university fees and the further piecemeal privatization of some of the key health service health services. Um, now, in May, the country has elected a conservative government um, majority. They've just come into power. Um, they've been described by some as neoliberalism on steroids. Um, taking this all even further, um, including the recent announcement of massive changes to labor law that aim to basically extinguish collective bargaining rights. Um, they're making, they're suggesting that um, industrial action can't take place unless 50% of all ballotable members have voted on a ballot, and of those you have to have 40%, um, no, you have to have 80% of the 50% um, voting for the action. So, um, which is, by the way, a much smaller percentage of the population than voted them into power. Um, so, um, so that's sort of the gloomy state of, of the government. Um, in these eras with resistance and organizing, you've had um, trade unionism hampered by lots of defeats of the mining strikes in the 80s, 
um, and various laws from that era that eroded collective bargaining rights, um, including banning closed shops and solidarity strikes and things along those lines. Um, there was a vibrant feminist movement through the 70s in the UK um, and into the 80s, and one that was, in its origins, openly anti-capitalist. Um, the decline of the women's liberation movement in the 80s and 90s alongside Thatcherism um, and a sort of sense of homelessness, home, sorry, hopelessness among many former enthusiasts took place, um, and at the same time, this is very broad strokes, but at the same time, you have also an exciting rise in the visibility of black feminist discourse engaged with issues of labor and migration, among other things. Um, during that time, the most socialist feminism that called itself by that name, um, to my understanding, um, became increasingly academic, um, partly in response to the lack of a broad-based movement. Um, but uh, there have been recent resurgences of people and groups actively presenting themselves as feminist, as in this country to some extent, um, from more liberal groups to many anarchists and also some socialists. Um, and there have also been, over these decades, um, many responses to racist police violence and rampant structural racism and the social disinvestment of um, in communities of color, which have led to periodic riots in a number of cities, um, both in the 80s and again more, more recently. Um, so, in fact, um, post-2008, there's been a visible resurgence in radical politics by way of this anti-austerity, responding to the austerity agenda. Um, it's not out of nowhere but um, it has meant pulling it together a huge range of other struggles that were going on all along, um, more or less. And so those struggles might have been harder to see because um, they may have been struggles for survival that didn't receive the same attention as, as large-scale movements and campaigns. Um, but many people perceive the austerity and anti-austerity as an occasion for a new popular anti-austerity politics. Um, and I think that's been much more notably the case since the 2010 establishment of the conservative liberal democratic coalition and the rise to power of the conservatives fully now. Um, so all of this, um, so the sense that this is a time for new activism, that, that sense I think is also a response to the refusal of a lot of organized left parties well into the 21st century um, to prioritize and engage in any concerted way with the kinds of oppressions that um, racialized and feminized people face in the UK. Um, and the British left has tended instead to have a predominantly workerist and sometimes um, xenophobic focus. So basically to place its hopes for revolution in a pretty limited conception of the British working class um, by which is meant primarily British nationals engaging in um, manufacturing, transportation, resource extraction, those kinds of jobs, um, usually men, and um, then presuming that those workers are likely to be xenophobic and racist, and so don't rock that boat, kind of that idea. Um, of course, this is, again, a generalization, but the, gen the, the dominant trend, I would say. Um, and that's meant a general failure to prioritize the fight against various forms of oppression, Islamophobia, xenophobia, racism, misogyny, heterosexism, transphobia and transmisogyny, and ableism. Um, or I would say that those different forms of division and of the lowering of people's life chances um, have tended to go at least unevenly addressed and deprioritized or thought of as secondary or peripheral issues by a lot of the major left parties. So the Socialist Workers Party, um, the former militant tendency now called the Socialist Party of England and Wales, um, group that puts out socialist appeal, those groups. Um, that's changing to some extent, um, largely I think as the fallout of scandals in the Socialist Workers Party um, over the revelation that the party had attempted to cover up allegations of rape and sexual assault by a leading member, um, which has led, I think, to more of a desire to 
consider um, what role feminism might have in those organizations. Um, but it's not yet clear what that means in practice for those groups, I don't think, to me, um, what that shift will mean. Um, so all of that is coincided with an emerging popular feminist, anti-racist, and queer rhetoric through social media, blogs, those kinds of things um, among students and um, younger people, not only younger people though, um, that give the sense that a new politics is needed. Um, one that's grounded in a popular movement against austerity, beyond the more sclerotic tendencies of the organized left, um, to appeal to this sort of image of the British worker that I was talking about, um, one that's not dem demographically accurate or doesn't actually take account of the most dynamic segments of the working class in, in the UK. Um, so many feminists are taking on an intersectional analysis that's similar to that of socialist feminists. Um, and for that, they're often um, receive pushback by some what are called trans-exclusionary radical feminists. So um, that has tended to further exacerbate the sense among younger people that a new feminist politics is needed, um, which sometimes can mean sort of throwing out, well, throwing out the baby with the bathwater or some less ridiculous metaphor or something <laughs> along those lines. Um, but what austerity has done is to provide a context for open, engaged arguments about basically what, it, what is social need, what do people need, what does society need, what would a society look like if it provided the opportunities for people to live together, experience joy, flourish, um, where that, rather than the pursuit of profits, would guide how people produce and organize the distribution of material wealth. Um, and it's also, this sort of context has revealed the extent to which changes wrought by austerity policies um, hit many women the hardest. Um, and a key tension remains, I would say, for the politics of feminist anti-austerity politics. Um, basically, should there be a push to restore the benefits of the welfare state, on the one hand, or, on the other hand, a rejection of the state as a source of oppression, surveillance, and sexual and racial violence. Um, and I don't think that's a simple either or, um, but it's, but it's a, a tension, I would say, that I've observed, not just I've observed. So I think that um, one of the ways to get at that tension or the contradictions between those two sort of attitudes toward the state um, um, is through the framework that I've that I'm interested in, the framework of social reproduction. And it's a framework that has been coming up between activist and scholarly feminist work, um, re-emerging as a framework in anti-capitalist feminist discussions and strategizing. And I think it's useful in a number of ways. Um, and I recently, for example, just heard an excellent talk given by um, the scholars Marina Vishmit and Zoe Sutherland, um, in which they were talking about this framework. So it's, it's, it's around. Um, so what do people mean by social reproduction? Um, they mean the processes by which human life is reproduced and by which the social relations of production, so the sort of relations through which people make things, um, how those social relations um, themselves are reproduced. So the processes involved are things that allow people to go to work and go back to work, so food, housing, things like companionship, kinship, love, um, but also things that allow those, that same kind of activities directed toward people who are not going to work, so children, unemployed people, um, some elderly people, those with certain forms of disability. Um, the things that allow people to stay alive um, and the generational reproduction of the labor force through childbirth. These are all under the heading of social reproduction. Um, many of those activities are done free of charge by those who can't afford to pay for them. Um, and they're also done disproportionately by women. Um, in countries like the UK and the US, they're often also offered as services on the market. Um, not only in those countries, but whether they're offered through corporations, so sort of fast food you think of, um, or as private services, so you think of 
I mean, independent child care work, those kinds of things. So it can be organized in all sorts of ways. Um, and those services are increasingly offloaded, as people know, in overdeveloped countries onto women and men of color and immigrants, um, many of them undocumented, who are employed by other people, often women, who do work outside of the home. Um, social reproduction, so in addition to all of those activities, could also involve processes like education, the work that I do, um, things like healthcare. So it's not necessarily a name only for um, what's thought of as domestic labor, um, and it's certainly not by any means exclusively or even mostly work that's done by people fitting the 1950s image of the middle class white housewife. Um, so social reproduction is actually a really broad category, and it's not always you know, totally distinct from other kinds of work or other kinds of processes. Um, it's just a framework for understanding the total workings of society and especially of complex and uneven class societies. Um, how do they keep going? Where does that come from? Um, or how do they not keep going very well? Or whatever else. Um, and one key thing that's um, often noticeable, I think, is that capital can run into problems when its needs for social reproduction come into conflict with its demands for the accumulation of capital, of profit. So, it will need to keep certain relations of production in place um, and keep the working class existing in some, to some extent, and that can conflict with its desire to make profits. Like, do we have to pay for you to live? That kind of, um, that's very crude, but something like that. Um, in other words, capital still needs workers, but it doesn't want to lose money by paying for workers' health, education, training, leisure activities, all of those kinds of things. Um, and in some circumstances, it actually helps work capital if workers are struggling for those things, um, but it usually still needs some workers to have access to some of those things. Um, of course, again, it needs different workers to have different amounts of those things as well. Um, and it needs a lot of people to be unemployed and to have a pretty difficult time getting those things. Um, and that's increasingly the case, I would say. Um, as the feminist theorist and activist Sylvia Federici has written, um, she writes, we've witnessed the systemic disinvestment by the state in the reproduction of the workforce, um, she's talking globally, um, implemented through structural adjustment programs and the dismantling of the welfare state. Um, the struggles of the 1960s, she says, have taught capital that investing in the reproduction of labor power does not necessarily translate into a higher productivity of work. Um, as a result, a policy and ideology have emerged that recast workers as what she calls micro-entrepreneurs, responsible for their self-investment, being presumably the exclusive beneficiaries of the reproductive activities expended on them. So basically, leave it the state increasingly wants to push that work onto people themselves, um, and capital wants that. Um, so Federici there is outlining basically the neoliberal economic doctrine that currently guides much of UK economic and social policy. Um, but as she continues, this tendency to demand that some go without the conditions for the robust meeting of social need, um, that tendency to demand that is not just a blip or a new trend, it is rather a component of capital's development that's not reversible under capitalism. So capitalism needs to do that, and always has, she says, more or less. Um, so she writes that capitalism fosters a permanent reproduction crisis. Um, if it has not been more apparent in our lifetimes, at least in many parts of the global north, it's because the human catastrophes that it has caused have most often been externalized, confined to the colonies, and rationalized as effects of cultural backwardness. Um, for most of the 80s and 90s, this is Federici still, um, the effects of the global restructuring in the North were hardly felt except in communities of color, but seen from the viewpoint of the totality of worker capital relations, whole world, these developments demonstrate capital's continuing power to basically um, separate workers from their collective power, undermine their organizational efforts, um, and so on. 
Um, and so this, what she, this global, what she calls a global destruction of reproduction, global destruction of those capacities, has everything to do um, with the massive numbers of economic and political migrants to countries like the UK, um, and remittances form a huge part of the economies of many countries, remittances from um, migrants working elsewhere. Um, they're very often sent by migrant workers, um, migrant women who are engaged in reproductive work in overdeveloped countries. Um, but this all need not only be a cause for pessimism and gloom, although it's certainly gloomy <laughs> and murderous. <laughs> um, this is where I think the socialist feminist perspective of organizations like the FSP are really important. Um, these kinds of considerations of the kinds of divisions that I've been outlining um, are a need to continue to be central to the on-the-ground organizing that we do, um, both as workers and as civilians, so that we understand the extent to which the global restructuring of reproduction is an attack on working class struggles um, that involves the reshuffling of gender, sexual, and racial dynamics. Um, so we need to emphasize both that, that many are out of place in, in the nuclear family model that's generally enforced, and that that model has been refused to many people. Um, and feminized and racialized people are increasingly in the vanguard of social movements um, that cut at the heart of capital's attempts to make workers um, afraid to refuse the conditions under which they're made to work. Um, and those are the people who are the logical leaders of our fights against capitalism and for human and planetary peri survival and flourishing. Um, I'm going to, with time in mind, skip a little bit um, and talk about two examples um, of the kind of organizing and action um, that I've been seeing. Um, so I'll talk briefly about the E15 movement in London. And I'll read a little bit from their website because I think they give a good description of what they've been doing. Um, so the Focus E15 campaign was born in September 2013 when a group of, um, of young mothers were served eviction notices by a housing association for, um, that had cut its funding to a hostel for young homeless people. And when they approached the council for help, um, mothers were advised that basically they'd have to um, accept private rented accommodations hundreds of miles away um, if they wanted rehousing. Um, and that attempt basically is a larger part of housing policy in, in major cities. Um, and the women's campaign that they engaged in as a result um, sort of culminated last September in the occupation of a disused block of flats on the nearly empty Carpenters estate in Stratford, East London. Um, most of the residents of the estate had been removed already by the local council who were planning to sell the land to a private developer, leaving around 600 housing units empty for probably a number of years. Um, and that's totally normal in London um, and around the UK right now. The number of empty residential spaces is significantly higher than the number of homeless people in the UK. Um, although the latter number is on the rise. Um, so the occupation basically drew attention to the fact that people are being forced out of London and their homes due to a lack of affordable housing, while thousands of perfectly good social housing units are sitting empty. Um, and so the occupiers, the E15 women, opened the flats to the public and ran them as a social center for two weeks. Um, with an evolving program of events, workshops, meetings, music, comedy. Um, and they were taken to court, um, but eventually the council agreed to let them stay for two weeks. Um, and they, they demanded basically that the estate be repopulated with secure long-term council tenants, um, that there be an immediate end to evictions of existing residents, um, that the estate not be demolished and that the estate be managed by the residents for the residents with no third party or private management. Um, so the, pre the practice of creating social centers in squatted and occupied properties is on the rise throughout the UK. Um, what makes this campaign especially interesting, if not completely unique, 
um, is that it's still focused on demanding that the state provide social housing and meet social need, um, rather than suggesting only that we should do it ourselves through social centers and things like that. So they demand that residents be able to manage the conditions of their housing, but that the state has to provide the resources for that housing. Um, and as I discussed already, um, that reflects or a navigation of the tension um, between demanding that the state meet these needs or um, saying that we should do this without the state. Um, and it seems to me that their specific demand for state provision but not state management um, is a useful direction to, to take. Um, and I don't think that these kinds of actions will on their own solve a housing crisis under a neoliberal austerity levering government, but they do seem like an inventive means to build a movement that might work in that direction. Um, and so all of these responses to crisis in, crises in social reproduction, um, I think, are things that trade unions need to take on as well, um, because people are willing to fight for them, and organized labor now in the process of being decimated needs to show that it will fight for the working class as a whole, um, and not only for the incremental wage and condition improvements claims that are legally sanctioned at the present time. Um, which are seldom victories anyway, those struggles. Um, so I'll move on to my final example, um, which has to do with detention centers in the UK. I might have to go a little faster than I skip over some things. Um, so um, there are currently around 15 operating detention centers in the UK um, for um, migrants. Um, thousands of people are detained at any given time and the largest number of detained people are asylum seekers who have claimed asylum and are waiting to know if they will be granted it. Um, there are also people who have been refused entry and are awaiting deportation, people who have been caught in raids by the UK Border Authority for overstaying their visas or for lacking sufficient documentation. Um, and many of these centers are used for long-term incarceration. Um, as in the U.S., they essentially function as prisons and are run without any meaningful due process rights for prisoners. Um, in the U.K., four of these centers are run by the government, while the rest of them are run by multinational corporations such as Serco, Global Solutions Limited, and the G4S Group. Um, yeah. Um, over the last decade or so, thanks to the exhaustive organizing and resistance of migrant people, many of them women, and a few whistleblowing former employees of the centers, um, it's become pretty well known that many of the centers are the sites of extreme human and civil rights violations. Um, until a few weeks ago, when a court finally ruled it unfair after years of protest, um, there was, so until then, there was something called fast track deportation, um, which basically meant that if you were from a country that they had deemed safe, they would automatically reject your um, application for asylum. Um, that has just been, which is patently ridiculous. Um, um, but that's nowhere near the end of the story, and um, I don't want to list all of the horrors of the centers. It would take more than all night, um, but I'll name some of the key points. Um, and you can certainly find more information about this, but basically people aren't given adequate information about how to present their asylum cases, People are detained indefinitely without any sense of the duration, without the adequate legal aid. Asylum isn't granted on any consistent basis to people who are fleeing gendered or sexual forms of discrimination and violence. Um, detained LGBT people are often subject to absurd tests to prove that they're really gay. Um, so well-known LGBT activist Adaranke Apata has repeatedly been denied asylum on the basis that she isn't really a lesbian because she had a child with a man. Um, wow. So, moreover, detention centers are basically used as storage spaces for people whose applications are being slowly processed, if at all, and people who have just been detained without um, legal documentation. Um, um, not surprisingly, there are many documented cases of physical and sexual abuse and torture of detainees, um, many of them women. 
And those who are detained um, and those who stand up to support them are subject to intimidation, um, violation of privacy, spying, all of those kinds of things. Um, so the Jarl's Wood Detention Center has been and especially notorious for its abuses of women detainees. Um, there is at present a lively and active group working to shut it down. Um, and other centers um, on June 6th of this year are surrounded by protesters demanding it be shut down. Um, it was called for and led by a coalition of groups, many of them migrant women's organizations. Protesters tore down the fences surrounding the center. There was a call and response between people inside the center and outside of the center, cheering and engaging. Um, those kinds of actions are ongoing um, at various centers. There's another one coming up in a couple weeks at Yarlswood again. Um, I got to hear from a range of protesters at a march outside of Parliament last month, um, a small demo. Um, I have a long description of this, but in the interest of time, I won't go through all of it. Um, I'll just say that there were people from a huge range of groups, including, including the All African Women's Group, Queer Strike, Women of Color Global Women's Strike, um, Black Women's Rape Action Project, Movement for Justice by Any Means Necessary, Crossroad Women's Center, Women for Refugee Women, numerous other groups which were spearheading this movement. There were also a number of members of parliament who had come along to say a couple things, most of them very sort of vague and um, not that helpful, and the women who were leading the um, rally challenged them for each thing. You know, if a Labour Party MP said, we need to stop this, they said, your party made these policies happen. Um, when a man, Peter Tatchell, who runs a pretty mainstream LGBT rights charity, got up and said that the women shouldn't be treated like common criminals, he was immediately challenged for that language. Um, people insisted that the struggle against incarceration is broader than a struggle simply against these particular centers and these particular conditions. Um, so all of these things are going on. Um, they openly, the leaders of this movement openly say that the horrific treatment of migrants is part of a broader political project to blame problems caused by the rich corporations and banks on migrant populations. Um, they speak about the ways that international borders are used to, refute, to restrict the movement and life chances of poor people, um, and which reflects, I think, FSP's long-standing call to open all borders for working people, um, since they're open to capital and corporations anyway. Um, especially at a time in the UK where thousands, or in Europe, where thousands of migrants, this is terrible, are drowning and murdered each year trying to cross the Mediterranean and the English Channel. Um, and the nearby governments use the ambiguity of maritime borders as an excuse to do nothing while this is happening. Um, one speaker said that the UK government, in refusing women asylum and detaining them, was punishing women for refusing to be poor. Um, I've got like three more minutes, will that be okay? Is that okay? All right. Um, okay, all right, thanks. Um, <laughs> I guess, you're, yeah, I will. Um, this is a movement that's growing and that has had the potential to grow further and to have some victories, um, such as you know the ending of this fast track project, but um, it also can grow beyond those kinds of immediate demands and it shows the signs of more far-reaching ambitions and aims um, beyond those that are rightly being demanded out of a need for survival. Um, and I think it can only be stronger if unions and anti-capitalist organizations, socialist organizations, follow the lead being taken by these courageous women and men who are really primarily migrant women in this case, um, who are not fearless but are facing up to fear out of necessity, out of a collective need to make lives that are not dictated by scarcity and fear, um, or the bare minimum of staying alive, um, but fighting for um, the ability to flourish. Um, so in closing, I imagine that a lot of this will sound familiar to many of you, as these struggles are global and intertwined, and the UK is like the US, an overdeveloped country with tremendous wealth disparities, um, but with, on the whole, a privileged relationship to wealth in the global scheme of things. Um, in spite of these similarities, 
Um, and in spite of the real material and economic and political links between the US and the UK, there are also conditions that aren't identical between the, the two contexts. Laws are different. Um, the composition of the working class and of capital are a little bit different in various ways. Um, so I wonder what it would mean to forge international solidarity around questions of housing and migration when the specifics are really rather different in different places, um, even if the problems um, are fundamentally the same. Um, so what can be shared across these borders? Um, and I think that the um, US and UK can benefit from more mutual understanding. The UK can benefit um, from the extent by which, I mean the US and UK, radical left in this case. Um, the UK could benefit from the extent to which the US left has paid at least more lip service to the importance of housing, austerity, and migration as political problems that affect racialized and feminized people in particular and often especially harsh ways. Um, and I think the US left could benefit um, from more of a sense that a lot of the massive problems we have here are happening elsewhere too, um, and sometimes in different ways. Um, and perhaps there are some tactical tools and strategies for organizing that can be shared internationally. Um, what's clear is that things need to change and that the people who really know that are those who are struggling most ferociously, not only out of necessity, but also with transformative visions of a world worth living in. Um, and I'll turn things over now to share your insights and thoughts, um, ask any questions, um, and I'll do my best to respond. Um, and mostly I'll want to hear from you all and talk informally over a drink. Thanks. <laughs> a lot of ideas and examples and invited you all to join in the discussion. So I wanted to point out there's two microphones in the room um, and if people would like to speak ideas, share your ideas or there's some information that Sam didn't have a chance to get to so questions are welcome too. But it's your turn. Just come on up to the mic Annalisa there. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to hear the connections. Um, I work in the public sector here in Seattle, and so one thing that resonated with me was the concept of the third sector, the private-public partnership. Could you talk a little more about um, how big of an industry are the nonprofits versus the state or the local government basically transferring wealth to you know, the private sector for those partnerships? Because um, I, I think there's, that seems to be a very big trend here. Maybe um, Sam will respond while the rest of you get some your ideas together and can bring them to the floor. And then we'll take a few ideas and Sam can respond afterwards. But you want to go ahead on that one, Sam? Sure. Um, I wish I could give you like, sorry, is this on? Yeah. I, so. I wish I could give you um, precise answers to that, and I don't think that I yet know fully. Um, I would say that it's a pretty similar situation um, in the UK. Um, what you tend to have in these, I don't know exactly about nonprofits, but what you tend to have is that government, suppose you know, like the NHS, National Health Services, um, will basically contract large portions of its services to either private or non-profit organizations that then will run that service. So it remains a single payer system at the point of payment, but um, the money, the state money is not going only to state run services. And that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about when I say that. But um, I mean, the other thing is that under new labor with this third sector thing, there was a huge emphasis on um, basically that the UK's way of having an economy would be through finance and through creativity. This was the way, with the end of 
deindustrialization. So you'd have like really important architects, and that this would revive the UK economy. So it was this idea that the economy had to be sparked up by the creativity of individuals, which would then um, sort of feed back somehow into the national economy for everyone. Um, I mean, that, that's the language of it. Um, I, that's not, I don't think, an accurate description of the way that the political economy worked, but that was the rhetoric. Sorry, I can't answer more specifically. But... Go to this microphone, and then to that microphone. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to uh, the intersectional feminists and how that, how those folks are similar and different, or different from socialist feminists. Because I'm very curious about that. I just wanted to thank you, Sam, very much for um, discussing both the the some of the academic issues and the real life struggle and, and not seeing them as separate. <laughs> very, very much appreciate that viewpoint. And um, I, I personally, I think that the thing we need to do is open up space for talking about how socialism is the only answer and organizing around that. And I don't know if you have anything to, to add to the the struggles you were looking at, but you know, we can win a few things here and there, but by and large, it's a question of just changing the fundamentals. Thanks, Sam, uh, for your talk. It took, a, it took us on quite a journey there. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks for being a feminist man, too. Appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm really struck by, you know, the talked about how there's, real, there's differences between the UK and the United States, but there's a lot of similarities in terms of the um, just everything, uh, you know, uh, funding, of, uh, lack of funding, or decline, you know, um, privatization, you know, anti-immigrant, um, you know, all, all those things that, that have been happening here or happening there, take slightly different shapes and different paces and everything like that, but it's the same, like the prison industrial complex, really, um, with the the, pri the private control of the detention centers, all those things. Um, so, um, and I've been in you know many many countries, and I see that stuff. But you know, certainly, what you what you said, being living there, kind of really solidifies that for me. Um, well, and one question I have is like, what what is the uh, what do people what do people do you have a feel for what people think about socialism in in the UK? Uh, we can come back to that later, but that's my question. Here. Take a couple. Yeah, thanks. Um, those are great questions. Um, for Hillary about intersectional feminists and socialist feminists, I'm not sure that that distinction is sorry, there you are. <coughs> is so different. I mean, so I'm not sure that, that that the UK would be give more insight into that necessarily. But my understanding there is that intersectional feminists can name a broader range of approaches in the, in the current moment. Um, that sometimes it can mean sort of there are lots of different kinds of oppression and they all happen and sometimes as with more Marxist inflected and other kinds of inflected approaches, um, different oppressions are understood as sort of forming and shaping each other, um, which I think is the original understanding of that. So um, in other words, not just all oppressions are equal and they all intersect, but rather, which is you know not what it was originally intended to mean. Um, I think that the, it has become a pretty, um, for good reasons, popular word, um, intersectionality um, in feminism. Um, I think that sometimes it can blur differences um, in terms of analysis, so like prioritizing of particular kinds of exploitation or um, or oppression in particular instances. That's very vague, but I don't know theoretically if that makes sense to you. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to think about it more, though. I think that there's more overlap than not, um, would be my answer. Yeah. Um, and then um, I think for Megan and Dennis's question are kind of similar about um, where I can answer them together. Um, what do people think about socialism in the UK? 
okay, and are people talking about this? Um, yes, I think that in the UK, socialism is also um, understood to mean sort of social democracy by many, many, many people, um, or understood to refer to sort of, as a word, to refer to kind of like the Northern European, um, kind of Scandinavian um, forms of welfare state. And so it's associated with a Labour Party, um, old Labour Party trajectory, I think, which is not what we mean by socialism. Um, I think that increasingly people are very much aware that um, things need to be organized around need. But that, that seems to be a kind of common sense among people with a broadly left <coughs> sympathy. Whether that, you know, how that's organized is, I think, as here, is the, is the big tension. Um, you know, whether, whether there needs to be a sort of, um, you know, state type apparatus or not. Um, or for how long, or under what conditions, or why, or is that the point, or is that not the point? Those are the, the tensions, I think. Yeah. Either way, um, I think the immigration stuff that you pointed out is very similar for, for both us and Europe. I imagine most of their immigrant stuff is all outside of the European Union. They, they've got the right to travel as they wish. My question is the militarization of the police. We've seen a lot of that post or as a result of the Iraq war. Has there been a militarization of the police in England such as there's been here? Hi, uh, my name is Mark. I'm an uh, organizer with the Freedom Socialist Party here in Seattle. And, um, I'm also a member of uh, a uh, public union, uh, SEIU, and uh, I work for for the University of Washington, and uh, what you were talking about about you know the the unions being like, well now that we're coming under attack, you know, we should probably try to like reach out to these community groups that are trying to help people. And it's just, I, think, I thought it was really interesting that that's exactly what's happening with my union right now, where you know for for years they've just sort of you know gone from contract to contract without really putting up much of a fight. And now all of a sudden that there's court cases coming down challenging the open shop, or the, uh, the closed shop, rather. Um, and, uh, you know, some other more restrictions on labor that, uh, that they're, they're starting to, to do the same thing. And so I guess I was wondering if you, if you knew, if you could speak to that, or like what, are, what the... Uh, what the unions are doing there, and then what, like, is the, you know, is that in conjunction with the Labor Party, and how that, you know, what, how that all is going on. This will probably seem a little off topic, but, um, um, I wanted to, uh, you seem to have a unique perspective on things, and I, um, listening to your credentials, I was struck by the, um, my own point of view is that things like art and poetry, song and music, are not being utilized as effectively today as, as in the past for radical movements. And I'm wondering if that's, um, if you see things differently than that, if there's a, um, if there's a, a way to strengthen that, because I think that's um, um, a way to get message out effectively. and. Um, it is, with social media as strong as it is, it seems like that's a, a, an opportunity, but I don't see my, where I interact with that, I don't see that happening. Do, do, you, do you see any future for that, I guess? Thanks. Great, yeah. Where I am, maybe. Yeah. So, I was in. I'm interested in more about who's debating. Should we take, should we make demands on the state, or should we try and just create services ourselves? Because I think that 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 issue of what which way forward do we go to gain these things is happening here also. I know that 
during Occupy, radical women put out a call to occupy the Washington State Capitol because they were calling a special session that was going to cut, I don't remember how much, like billions, billions from the budget that was going to devastate social services, child care, things like that. And we brought a resolution to Occupy asking them to endorse it and support it and participate. And it lost because we had four demands on the state. Don't cut social services, tax the wealthy, uh, it was like two other that were pretty radical demands and uh, it was a minority that blocked it but it was on the argument that we do not engage with the state whereas we said we've created the wealth of the state we want to take it back so you know it was sort of anarchist versus socialist do we so I'm interested who's who and how do those debates play out great um, great questions um, Regarding Gary's question about the militarization of the police, I think that certain military technologies are definitely in use, but the police are not as armed as the US police, famously. Um, so yes, there's militarization, certainly in terms of things like spying and um, the kinds of tactics that are being used to deal with large groups of people. Um, those kinds of things are certainly borrowing, to my understanding, from military technologies and things like that. But in terms of the sort of weapons grade stuff, I don't think it's quite on pace with what's happening in the U.S. That's, that's my sort of perceived understanding of things. Um, um, Mark, in terms of trade unions and um, the kinds of actions that are being taken, yes. <laughs> um, I think that, I mean, I was saying that I think trade unions need to engage with these kinds of community actions. They certain they aren't on the whole, or they are, but when they are, it is generally through a kind of, I think, yes, a Labour Party sanctioned way of doing that. Of course, rank and file members are doing all sorts of things, um, and great things, but I think, um, I was suggesting that, yeah, maybe, you know, to try and gain some social power back for trade unions, that might be achieved by breaking from some of the sort of officially sanctioned activities that are supposed to be what unions are doing now, which is really very little, um, very little effective. That's how they were built in the first place. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then in terms of the, the question about art and music and poetry and song, I'm not sure that I necessarily have an answer to that question. Um, I think that a lot, I mean, in my experience, there's tons of music um, and art that's being made in relation to social movements. It's just it doesn't have the same platforms for distribution and circulation maybe that, um, that more sort of corporate music um, do. Um, so that would be a question about sort of harnessing technologies and things like that. I don't really have, I don't really know how to, how to do that. <laughs> um, Mark might, other people here might, I'm not sure, yeah. Um, um, but, um, but no, I, I have, I mean, there, I have seen lots of spoken word and, um, amazingly inventive um, banners and, you know, beautiful works of, of creative art, I would say, in these movements. Um, um, and then Anne, who is debating should we make these demands? Um, I would say it's, it's not quite as clear-cut as anarchists or socialists, but um, in my experience, you know, a lot of this comes from the people I see the most are students, are university students. Um, and they're the people who will often, or people around that age, um, not all of them students by any means, from all sorts of backgrounds, um, are very often the people who will be engaging in the kind of like creation of a social center, or those kinds of squatting type work. Um, not exclusively but the people I see doing that. And it's, I'm hearing those kinds of arguments there among, among feminists. Um, I think that the UK feminist movement 
has even the sort of libertarian branches in the 70s were wanting to make demands of the state. Um, the, you know, to say you need to do this for us. The black feminist movement in the UK was largely, to my understanding, um, in the 80s, sort of perceiving the state as a source of violence. Um, so it's, it's there to some extent that you have different relations to the state historically in feminism. But that's a different question from who now, yeah, is, is having those arguments. Something like anarchists and socialists, maybe, <laughs> yeah. I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. Woman in green, <coughs> and then woman in red. <laughs> First green, then red. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, being here and um, listening to you convey your experiences um, to have an understanding that it's a global situation that's happening opposed to limited in the United States. I also want to know, is there um, a connection or a relationship happening between um, the UK or other countries and the United States as well to help come up with some clarity to help th these issues of homelessness, mental illnesses, uh, racism, I mean everything, I don't know, <laughs> I mean all of it, and um, you would be more familiar because, well I think so, but um, <laughs> um, I just kind of would like to know if there is a relationship to kind of guide and help people and that they're on the same page, Thanks. to have cohesiveness. Um, Sam, you mentioned uh, fascism rising in England, and um, this is also a cross-the-border thing, as we know, and uh, it's especially in, in, in Greece, uh, heavy under uh, austerity measures, and in, in our new newspaper, The Freedom Sources, we have the fight against fascism in Australia. And it's a good fight that's being waged there. And tomorrow, the KKK has a rally in, Char in Columbia, South Carolina. And we have sent two of our comrades down there to join the counter-KKK rally in South Carolina, <laughs> which we're very glad to be able to do. And so I'm wondering what, to what degree, okay, women especially, but, but the unions, and I would suspect the immigrants, because I bet you the fascists are especially going after immigrants there, as they are every place. What is the fascist movement, uh, anti-fascist movement, uh, doing in, in the UK? Okay, the microphone. I guess we have the woman in black now. <laughs> that's right. No, but anyways, um, uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, another thing that we've been able to do here in Seattle um, <coughs> is, and I and I, I know it's it's happening in other uh, places across the U.S. is the coalitions at the grassroots level in the labor movement. We've got Owls Organized Workers for Labor Solidarity, which uh, has built cross-union alliances um, be, to kind of counter the, um, the conservatism and the just getting behind the Democrats and, and a very conservative outlook of the labor leadership and, and taking on a lot more of the, um, you know, some of the issues that you were talking about, women, people of color, um, what's happening to immigrants. I was wondering, have you seen stuff like that happening in England, especially on campus, alliances between um, perhaps students and campus workers? And then just the other question, uh, are people talking at all? Is there any kind of anger or solidarity with the people of Greece in this whole IMF um, hijacking of their economy? Let's do a couple more and then Sam will respond. Oh, OK, 
okay. Okay. Well, um, your question, the woman in green, <laughs> uh, wanted, I started thinking about the um, international work. Um, that is my question to you. Um, what do you think about um, forming international alliances? Uh, because right now, capitalism is a global monstrosity, and it's going to take a, an international effort. So, I was wondering if you see a, a potential there in, in England to to form a working relations with an organization, especially one that's socialist feminism. Um, um, well, my name is uh, Christina. I'm, I'm also a member of the Freedom Socialist Party and Radical Women, and also um, the Comrades of Color Caucus Coordinator. So I just wanted to also say that we, um, that FSP also has a, um, international relations with uh, organizations in Latin America, and I was wondering if there's potential right there in, in the, um, in, England or, or even Ireland. So I just had to ask. Love the Irish. Should I go ahead? Okay. Well, um, I got really excited when you were talking about the detention centers because it's so parallel because here in Tacoma, Washington, uh, the detention center is owned by the GEO Corporation. It's also that you mentioned owns detention centers in England. So the possibility for joint work right there goes bing. Yeah. Um, and it's also all women that are leading the fight down in Tacoma uh, on the outside. On the inside, some of the hunger strikers have been men that have been leading as well. But um, And then, uh, oh, I won't go into the rest of this. I have a question and a plug. I, I don't know what you mean by a hostel. Um, here, that's what students stay in on vacation, so it sounds like it's something different there when you talked about the housing. But when we finish, I really want to put a plug in for books and the ideas you were talking about. You know, like the whole, do you need a revolution or can you reform the system? Um, Rosa Luxemburg was revolutionary. Um, she was Polish and German, I believe. Anyway, she, there's a book of hers called Reform and Revolution, which is still great. Um, the Radical Women Manifesto. This is called, uh, it's a pamphlet called Socialist Feminism and the Revolutionary Party, um, which, because you were dissing a lot of the left, but not all the left's crappy, so um, please read this. <laughs> no, I know you're in the Socialist Party, but you know, people can start to think the left is just um, backward, and some of it is, but a lot of it is not. And then uh, Revolution, she wrote by Claire Fraser, is, is a really great one. So check it out when you know, we finish. Yeah. So we have one more person up at the mic. And we can go ahead. And then we'll, um, unless there's other hands that want to speak at this moment, there's more time to speak, but then we'll have Sam respond to the questions that people have raised as well as kind of summarize the discussion and where to next and then we'll break up for cocktails and more conversation. Glenn? Okay, Glenn Kirkendall, Freedom Social Party, Morning Oregon. Thank you for sharing your presentation. It gives us an international perspective. Also in Portland, Oregon, we have a large British community call themselves socialists, but it gives me a, a way to understand to reach out to them. I had so many questions, but I'll save them for the talk later on tonight. But the one question I do have raised is that here in the U.S. we bring U.S. foreign policy, both military and big business, support big businesses, as driving immigrants to the U.S. There's a discussion of accusing the British government, because here, they're, unlike the U.S., we use our own military. The British use special forces of private armies. They have their special base. They train their so, elite soldiers down in Belize, here off of South America. And then they also pay mercenaries to do the dirty work to top of governments they don't like in Africa. Thank you. Um, OK, lots of questions, interesting <laughs> ideas, too. Um, Regarding the first question, um, regarding um, whether there is sort of clarity and connection around these issues, of, I don't know that I know the answer to that better. I, I would say there are, you know, of course there are 
people who circulate between the US and the UK. There are media that circulate between the two, and there are left organizations in correspondence with each other and feminist movements in correspondence with each other. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's like, I mean, I certainly didn't, I can speak for myself, you know, before having experiences of both countries, I wasn't, it wasn't even on my radar um, what was happening in the UK and how the UK interfaced with the rest of the world. So, um, not in any real way. So I would say maybe, maybe not so much. Um, I don't, but other people may have a different sense of that. Um, in terms of anti-fascism, um, that is one area in which um, England, Scotland, Wales, um, and Ireland all have a pretty proud um, tradition, both unfortunately in response to fascists um, who are also there. Um, but I would say that, I mean, pretty much always at least where I am, if there is some sort of um, or gathering of fascists, there will be a gathering of anti-fascists, and they will fight. They will go and they will fight. Um, pretty much all of that. Yeah. Um, and that's a you know there are sort of martial arts trainings for anti-fascists. There are all sorts of things that go on. Um, so that that's been my impression. That's not to say that the whole of society engages with those. But for example, the group called March for England would come and march in Brighton where I live because it's sort of reputed for being, you know, it's where lots of gay people live. It's sort of um, very progressive, ostensibly. So the fascist groups would come once a year to sort of taunt the city. And they didn't come this year because they got so badly beat up the year before. <laughs> Yay! <Yeah. So. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't stop them from going to other places where people might be more vulnerable, though. But um, but there's always a fight back in my experience. Yeah. Um, regarding Linda's question, I will say, sorry, that aside, there is still a really alarming rise of interest in the skate in UKIP, the new sort of populist, proto-fascist major party. Um, it didn't do it didn't do well in terms of getting seats in parliament, but it got a, an alarmingly high number of the popular vote across the country. Um, and yeah, that's a reality, and it's it's largely through appeal to a sort of nationalist and anti-immigrant sentiment um, and anti-Europe sentiment as well. Um, those are the things that that are happening, and that happens. Um, I think one of their biggest bases of support is in parts of Essex, um, where boats from Calais, like from France, that often bring in um, migrants, um, immigrants are coming from. They have the sort of the party has a big base there, so that is happening. Yeah. Um, Linda's question about labor things like like. Um, sort of labor solidarity and alliances and things along those lines. I think that's a great question. Um, I haven't seen anything like OWLs. That doesn't mean it's not there. Um, there are certainly labor-focused groups. I mean, there's groups like Caribbean Labor Solidarity, things like that. I don't know enough about the concrete work that they do to answer that, but they're sort of community-based groups that bring together questions of labor. Um, those do exist. In terms of campus alliances, um, I mean, the, the university I'm at has had attempts to do that in particular um, when they were outsourcing um, the estate staff and a lot of administrative staff. And I mean, the students fought a whole lot harder than the unions did. Um, was my that was the year before I arrived um, at the university, but that's pretty much what I've what I've gathered. Um, and well, yeah, let's hope, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, I, the efforts are made. Um, I would say, also I should say, the students a lot fought a lot harder than the academic staff fought. Um, that's not to say that, um, yeah. I mean, as there were plenty of individual academic staff who fought really hard, but as sort of representative bodies, that wasn't really, wasn't really happening. 
Although if you go to the campus now, if you look around there, anyone who has a yellow paper in their window was symbolically supporting the occupation that students did in defense of the, um, in defense of the outsourced workers. Um, they're now all faded to a sort of creamy, <laughs> off-white color. Um, yeah, they're still in the window, yeah. Um, Christina's question about international work and potential for alliances, I've been talking, talking to Doug and <laughs> Gary about that. Um, I, I don't know that I have an absolute answer for that in terms of all of the UK. I can say in the, in the places that I've been, um, I'm not sure that I've met up with left parties that would want to necessarily join up with the FSP in the south of England, with socialist feminists. Um, I think there are plenty of, of socialists and feminists who would, but not necessarily organizations. Um, that's my understanding. I hope I've proven wrong, so maybe that will change. Um, and um, for, Sue had a small question about a hostel. <laughs> um, I think it, it just means like temporary, um, or like, sort of like the way we, the sh shelter, something like that, or the way that we might use like a residence hotel or something like that, that's kind of medium term. That's my understanding. Um, and then finally for, and also yes, those books are great, people should look at them, the ones that you recommended. And then um, Glenn's point about UK foreign policy, I mean you knew more details there than I did about those sort of operations, so, um, but I would say that, I mean, there is definitely a sense that the UK government, whether or not it's its own military, is invested in a lot, you know, has a lot invested in at stake in the kinds of wars um, and um, sort of imperialist ventures that are taking place um, around the world. Um, so even though it's not quite the monolith that the US military is, I think people have a sense that the government is, is in, is involved with that. Um, yeah, that is the end of the questions. Um, I don't have any closing remarks except to just um, thank everyone again for listening and um, for your great ideas and I uh, hope to talk to you all more. Thanks. Thank you. Sam, and I think <laughs> this is certainly the uh, beginning or at least the middle of a conversation and not the end of it, so we want to stick around. Um, Mark, I wanted to have you say a few words. Yeah, I have one. <laughs> so, sorry. So we, uh, we talked a lot about, uh, well, not a lot, but some about fascism tonight, and I um, think that we... Uh, Definitely, it's it's on the rise here as well, and I just wanted to point out in our, the newest uh, issue of the news of the Freedom Socialist newspaper, there on the inside cover, there's actually a really great spread of two different articles uh, talking about uh, about uh, racist groups and, and uh, in in the U.S. and also in Australia, where we have a section of the of the Freedom Socialist Party. So this first one. I feel like I'm like in the middle of everyone. <laughs> I'll just shout here. So the the first one is on the inside cover. It's our uh, our uh, statement about the Charleston killings. Uh, and uh, well, I, I bring this up because we. So as someone mentioned earlier, there's the KKK has said that they're going to the South Carolina. Capitol building tomorrow, tomorrow to rally, and the, and the Freedom Socialist Party and Radical Women have sent uh, a few of their member, of our members to go down there, to go there and join what I hope is going to be a massive rally against these racist bigots and uh, and the and hopefully the you know brings you know the opposition to the, the white supremacy built into the American system. Of Government and society and, and, and the economy. Um, 
So, uh, so that's this, and, and this is, uh, it says, uh, it is the, the, the Charleston killings are an indictment of a racist system. And I think this was a really great uh, uh, statement that really hit a lot of good points, and I really uh, recommend reading it. And then on the other side here is uh, from Melbourne, Australia, where there was recently a, a, a fascist group, a racist uh, group that uh, called, uh, I think, Reclaim Australia, which <laughs> sounds, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but our, our comrades down there, uh, down under, were also really uh, involved in a coalition that fought against the, the fascists and turned out huge numbers of counter-protests. Um, so I think uh, it's a good, really good look at how you know, anti-fascist forces are organized and why it's important to uh, to to fight fascism wherever, whenever it appears its ugly head. So just wanted to put a plug in for our newest issue of the Freedom Socialist newspaper. Uh, you can grab a copy on your way out, and um, and yeah, so, and, and make sure to sign up on our sign-in sheet. To, uh, so, so we can stay in touch and help you know, build that same sort of anti-fascist coalition here in Seattle and across the continent. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, uh, remember the party on Sunday. It's supposed to be 90 degrees, so we have air conditioning and good food. And a wonderful send-off. There's upcoming events. And I think with that, we'll say the bar is open. It's Friday night. And we will um, get some food and something to drink. We'll have the raffle upcoming.